Welcome everyone uh, to this second in our Beyond 1.5 series this fall. I'm Heather Goldstone, Chief Communications Officer at Woodwell Climate Research Center, and I'm thrilled to be with you this afternoon. Uh, it was a pleasure to welcome hundreds of you to our first event in this series two weeks ago. Uh, and I would love to see if you can find that little raise hand, the little hand icon down at the bottom of your screen, Raise your hand if you were with us for that first event two weeks ago. Fabulous, the numbers are, are ticking up here. We've got at least uh, a, several dozen folks who were with us the first time around and here today, which is great. Um, these events really have been planned as a series and you can go ahead and put your hands down or we'll do that later, don't worry about it. Um, really planned as a series, um, you know, these uh, events, are meant to walk us all together through a process of confronting the full magnitude of the climate crisis that we currently face, the risks and also the choices um, that are in front of us in a rapidly warming world and as we race to restore a safe and stable climate. Um, the goal is not to leave this process or come out of this process feeling overwhelmed and depressed, but rather motivated with an increased sense of urgency and ambition and vision for where we could be headed. Uh, that's uh, the, the solutions part of the equation will come in the next few events that we have. Um, today, we're going to continue the process that we started with our first event and looking at some of the really critical risks that we face to help us understand uh, the problem that we face. Because of course, if we don't understand the problem, we can't craft effective solutions. Before we go any further, I would like to thank the KNEB family for their support of this series. Um, of course, while we all uh, enjoyed and many of us miss gathering for in-person events, uh, we do recognize that these virtual events give us an amazing opportunity to bring uh, more diverse and more far-flung uh, groups together, both in terms of our panelists and in terms of you, those who are able to join us for these. So we really appreciate the support of the KNEB family in helping us make these possible. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today and that Woodwell Climate Research Center is located on the traditional and sacred lands of the Wampanoag people who have lived in this place that we often call Cape Cod for thousands of years and whose language, culture, and traditions continue to be a vibrant part of our community. Woodwell Climate also recognizes, of course, that indigenous leadership, knowledge, and stewardship are invaluable in the global effort to restore a safe and stable climate. So as I mentioned, today's conversation will delve into what panelists actually in our first event highlighted as one of perhaps the greatest and perhaps most under-recognized uh, risks and challenges in our effort to restore a safe and stable climate. And that's often what's called tipping points, points of no return. Um, in addition to the increasingly obvious impacts of climate change on society in our daily lives, from heat waves and fires to floods and hurricanes, global warming driven by greenhouse gas emissions from human activities are also changing the natural world and threaten to set in motion processes that can become self-feeding that are often called vicious cycles or feedback loops and the impacts of these feedbacks can essentially be irreversible on human timescales, meaning it would take a very long time to stop or reverse some of these processes if they reached a certain point. But pinpointing where those points are exactly is no simple matter. And the whole issue of tipping points in climate change remains uh, a matter of considerable scientific discussion. We've all heard Greta Thunberg at the UN a few years ago talking about tipping points and feedback loops. She also tends to call on us to listen to the scientists. So that's exactly what we're going to do today and in the next hour. Specifically, we're gonna hear from our three panelists, um, two of whom uh, are from Woodwell Climate and one from uh, a, our close neighbor down the road, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm going to introduce them extremely briefly and then let them actually introduce their work. The three of them are experts on very different uh, systems, very different parts of the world, very different parts of the climate system, uh, although that share this common point of the discussion about 
tipping points and uh, where going past a tipping point might land us. Um, one of our panelists, it seems, has actually uh, just stepped away for a moment. So hopefully Sarah uh, Doss will be back with us in a moment. That's Dr. Sarah Doss, an associate scientist uh, in geology and geophysics at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution who studies polar ice sheets, uh, obviously a critical part of this uh, this conversation. So hopefully she'll be rejoining us in just a moment. But still with us, uh, Dr. Sue Natale, Director of Woodwell Climate's Arctic Program and a real pioneer in studying Arctic permafrost. And also Dr. Mike Coe, who leads our tropics program and has been studying the Amazon forests um, for decades now. So thank you both for being here. And Sue, I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce us all to permafrost. Okay, so I'm going to provide a really brief overview of um, feedbacks and tipping points from permafrost thaw. Um, this is going to be a, a quick overview of permafrost and some of the impacts of it thawing. Um, if you want more information, you know, we can talk more about it on this panel. Also, you can go to the Woodwell Climate website, and we also have a new website called unstableground.org that focuses uh, specifically on climate changes in northern regions. Um, so just um, I feel like most people probably already know what permafrost is, but for those of you who don't, it's perennially frozen ground, so it does not thaw in the summertime. Um, it's located in the polar regions and in mountain regions, and um, it's any material that's in the ground, so it can contain um, a lot of buried ice. You can see that as the shiny areas shown in this uh, hill slope exposure. Also contains a lot of carbon um, in the form of frozen organic soils. Okay, so this is just um, a map showing the distribution of permafrost in the northern region. Um, it's fairly widespread, so all the areas shaded in blue, this is the northern permafrost region. It's almost twice the size of the United States. Uh, much of the permafrost in the US is in Alaska, um, Russia and Canada also contain large amounts of permafrost. Um, so it's a fairly large area, but the area um, where there is permafrost is shrinking as a result of climate change. The Arctic is warming you know, three times faster than the rest of the planet, and this is having an impact on the distribution of permafrost. Um, by the end of this century, um, we, you know, the permafrost is thawing now. We expect 30 to 70 percent loss, and you know that that wide range um, is driven by human action. And so if we continue on our current greenhouse gas emission trajectory, um, that's the 70%. So we'll lose more than half of the near surface permafrost. And we can cut that in a half by greatly reducing our fossil fuel emissions. Um, so that's a problem for the people who live in the Arctic because permafrost provides support for infrastructure and for, for homes and for, um, habitats that people rely on, um, but it's also a problem for everyone on the planet because the permafrost stores a lot of carbon. So current estimate is about 1.5 trillion tons of carbon is currently contained in permafrost. Uh, that's two times as much carbon as is in the Earth's atmosphere and three times as much as every tree in every forest on the planet. So um, there's a lot of carbon there. And this is the reason why it's a problem because once uh, as the climate warms, the permafrost is thawing. Um, once that permafrost thaws, that carbon, which was in the form of our uh, frozen organic material, once it thaws, it then becomes available for microbes to use. Uh, they break it down and they release greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4. Um, and one thing I want to point out, so this is an amplifying feedback loop or sometimes called a positive feedback loop. But the one thing I want to point out is that right now, this arrow is going one direction. So we're warming the climate, we're increasing permafrost thaw, leading to more, you know, that will lead to more warming. The arrow can certainly go in the other direction. So if we cool the climate, it is definitely feasible that permafrost can refreeze. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind is that the carbon that is contained in permafrost took tens of thousands of years to accumulate. Releasing that carbon over a year, 10 years, 100 years into the atmosphere is essentially making that carbon uh, irreversible, uh, the uptake of that carbon irreversible on a human relevant timeframe. So it's not impossible, um, 
but it's important to keep in mind that the timing of these processes. And then the other important thing to keep in mind about permafrost thaw is like, yes, indeed, the ground can refreeze, but what often happens is something like this. So this was a relatively flat forest where I work in Siberia. Um, you know, as a result of permafrost thaw, all that ice in the ground uh, melted and the ground collapsed. And you see there's no longer living trees in this forest. There's some grasses recovering. Um, but much of the soil, a lot of the organic material was eroded and washed off and eventually um, emitted into the atmosphere. So when we think about whether this is irreversible, um, the time scale and also the spatial scale of the processes are really important. Um, and finally, just uh, one last slide and just how um, how severe, how much carbon will be released into the atmosphere. That while there's some uncertainty around this, um, the number can be quite large. So if we continue on our current greenhouse gas emissions trajectory, um, it might be equal to 150 billion tons cumulated by 2100. And just to give you some perspective, uh, that's on par with the current rate of US emissions. So if we take, if US continues on their current emissions through 2100, this is about how much we can expect to see from permafrost. So it's, it's not a trivial amount and it will contribute to increased warming. Um, with that, I'll stop and pass it back to you, Heather. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Um, I was looking at that picture of the, the forest you just showed there, and those of us from New England are familiar with frost heaves, but that's a, a whole other level of, um, of upheaval due to, to thawing and freezing. So thank you for taking us there so we can actually um, have a better sense of, of what it looks like on the ground. So I want to turn next to Sarah. We're going to stick with uh, the, the cold polar regions of the world for the moment, um, but a very different type of feedback uh, loop and very different system involved here. So um, Sarah, introduce us to the ice sheets that you work on and this issue of, of tipping points and feedback loops and, and how that um, comes through in the, the work that you do. And I'm going to share my screen here with, with Sarah's slides. So just give me one second to do that. All right. Great. Thanks, Heather. Um, and welcome, everyone. So um, as Heather mentioned, um, I'm Sarah Doss. I'm a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And I work on the large polar ice sheets um, that you find in the Arctic. Arctic and the Antarctic. And um, those are illustrated here, uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of places I'm talking about. So on the left, we have the large polar ice cap of Antarctica and on the right of Greenland. Um, these are both large islands that are covered with ice over two miles thick in many places. And these ice sheets represent a huge reservoir of fresh water, uh, together enough to raise global sea level more than 200 feet. Um, Heather, if you just click once more, you'll see there's a short animation that will start. Um, there, now you're looking at the seasonal view around both poles. And what you also see changing is uh, the snow and ice cover and the sea ice cover. So the large ice sheets are stable, uh, relatively stable on a seasonal scale over time. Um, but you also have these large seasonal variations in, in particular in sea ice. So on the left, you'll see Antarctica, which has the waxing and waning of sea ice um, as it grows out into the Southern Ocean and retreats back each year. Um, and on the right around Greenland, uh, you'll see the waxing and waning of the Arctic sea ice, which um, fills in and then retreats across the Arctic Ocean. Um, and I, I draw that to your attention just because sometimes there's a little bit of confusion when we talk about polar ice or ice sheet collapse, whether we're talking about um, the large land continental ice masses or sea ice. You could go forward to the next slide. Um, Heather, could you? There you go. Thanks. So, um, the polar ice sheets uh, that we saw in the last view are, are a really critically important part of the Earth system. And while much of the focus, rightly so, is on their contribution to sea level rise, and that's mostly what I'll be um, talking and discussing uh, a bit about today in terms of tipping points, it's worth pointing out that the large fluxes of fresh water that um, come into and out of, the, in particular, out of the ice sheets um, is also really critical to other parts of the Earth system. Um, this large freshwater can affect ocean circulation and ecosystems and, then it, and is really in, intimately connected with other parts of the um, Earth system. 
But what I what I really want to um, drive home today is this point about uh, the rapid changes that we're experiencing now in the polar regions um, in both Greenland and Antarctica. These ice sheets are rapidly melting, so they're losing more ice each year than they're gaining through snowfall. And there's a lot of talk, uh, and we'll focus a bit today on um, whether these ice sheets are at a tipping point or approaching a tipping point. Um, and there's many ways to think about that, uh, but. Um, for the most part, uh, we see the loss of this ice as um, irreversible and accelerating over time. So there's two main uh, forcings behind this loss of, of large uh, ice, polar ice. Um, one is through the warming of the atmosphere, and the other is through the warming of the ocean. And so we're kind of attacking these ice sheets from both sides. Uh, so you, we know the Arctic and the Antarctic are warming. and um, as the atmosphere warms, you have more and more melt uh, that contributes to the melting away of the surface of the ice and that runoff into the ocean. And as the ocean warms, any place where you have ice in contact with the ocean, so around the edges of the large ice sheets, you have this warm ocean water eating that ice away. Now, those things on their own are not examples necessarily of critical thresholds or tipping points, but what we start to see happening, um, and this is illustrated in this uh, now sort of iconic uh, image on the left, which is, is, is now almost two decades old, this collapse of the Larsen B ice shelf, so this is a floating portion of glacier ice in the Antarctic Peninsula, is that sometimes this loss of ice is very rapid and dramatic. It's not just a slow eating away. And this is an example where you had a bit of surface melting or ponding on the ice shelf. It was able to crack apart or hydrofracture the entire ice shelf. And in the course of about a month, this entire ice shelf splintered apart and floated away. It's kind of on a loop, as you'll see. Um, the loss of an ice shelf itself isn't necessarily uh, going to raise sea level, but it has a lot of other effects on the ice flow behind it. And we can get into that later. Um, on the right, you'll see a sort of cartoon view, which is an example of the uh, dynamics that we're concerned about in large parts of West Antarctica. This is a cutaway view of a glaciers, uh, for example, like Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica. And what you see here is that this ice sheet is entering the ocean, um, has a large tongue entering the warm ocean, and this ocean water is eating away at the base of the ice. And so the ice uh, breaks apart and retreats over time. But because the land inland, as you go into the interior of Antarctica, um, gets steeper and deeper, the more ice that you eat away at the front, the faster the ice that's behind flows into. And so you create this runaway effect, this marine, what we call marine ice sheet instability. Um, and so the more the ice is lost, the faster it flows, the faster it stretches, and the more quickly it's lost and it builds upon itself. And so this is um, a dynamic that we're very concerned about in the Western Arctic in particular. Um, if you go to the next image. So this is not a polar ice sheet. It's very hard to wrap your mind around, I find, the loss of a large polar ice sheet because it's so vast. This is, is something to just kind of make you go, oh, or wow, or oh no. Um, this is an example of a mountain glacier. So this is a small ice cap on top of Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. And what you see illustrated on the right is over the course of just a decade or so, most of this ice cap has disappeared. Um, and this is due to the warming and drying out of this region due to climate change. And this is being experienced all across the globe with smaller mountain glaciers and ice caps um, that are re re uh, retreating and disappearing very quickly. And over the course of the 20th century, that was actually a fairly large contributor um, to sea level rise. The larger polar ice sheets are now eclipsing that. And on the left is, um, is this sort of iconic image um, of, uh, of ice climber Will Gadd, who um, has returned to Mount Kilimanjaro multiple times. Um, and, and this is really just an example of the last bit of a, of a glacier in demise. Um, and we're not going to see this in the Antarctic or in Greenland, but this is where we're headed in some ways. And this is where mountain, very, very many mountain glaciers that are disappearing are headed. And so if something sticks with you in the back of your mind about what an irreversible loss of ice is, maybe this picture will. Next one. Um, another way to think about uh, the loss of ice um, is towards uh, commitment points. Um, and so we'll be discussing that a bit in this conversation, whether we should be thinking about these tipping points or commitment points. 
Um, but what we're really trying to illustrate here in this map view, this is the results of a modeling study from a couple of years ago, is that the extent of a big ice sheet like Greenland is very sensitive to the warming or emissions pathways that we're on. And that's where we have a lot of control. This is, this is the kind of figure that if anything should give you hope or, or make you want to take action. Um, so this is a view model modeling Greenland out just over the next thousand years. Uh, and what you see is under various uh, emissions pathways, um, uh, 2.6, which is sort of the Paris goals up to 8.5, which is kind of sometimes called business as usual or, or the um, course that we're on, the shape and size of, of the Greenland ice sheet uh, changes dramatically from um, what you know looks like a little bit of retreat uh, to, towards pretty much almost entirely lost. Next, are we? And I wanna end uh, on, on sort of, uh, Heather asked us to kind of imagine what does a world uh, um, past a tipping point, in this case, world without ice look like. Of course, um, you know, the major uh, uh, consideration when you lose all of polar ice is, is sea level rise. Um, while we're not headed directly towards a world with no ice, this is an example. Um, we experience sea level rise locally or regionally, not globally. Um, so for those of you that are tuning in from the East Coast US or, or Northeast or New England region, uh, this is a map view of Southern New England. And it's just illustrating that once you take away um, all of the ice, the scale of change that we that we are um, headed towards. Um, and this is uh, an extreme example. I don't believe that we're on course to melt uh, melt all of the polar ice sheets. Um, but I don't know that that is much cause for comfort. Uh, what you see here is all of Cape Cod and all of the major cities underwater. Um, but we don't need to melt all the polar ice to really cause dire harm to the world. More than 600 million people, so 10% of the world's population, live in coastal areas less than 10 meters above sea level. And that is on scale with the loss of Greenland and Antarctica pathway, we are very much headed down today. And I would argue that how fast that happens is still up to us. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay, so just within the polar regions, two very different processes going on with permafrost thaw, emissions from that potentially feeding runaway warming, in Sarah's case, uh, the uh, processes that drive ice sheet melting, the possibility there of runaway melting um, and, and extreme sea level rise. And now we're going to shift gears uh, perhaps even more dramatically and head to the tropics, to tropical forests, and hear about the potential tipping points and, and feedback loops that are of concern there. So Mike, I will hand it to you. Thank you, Heather. Yes, yeah, so I'll just very briefly talk about um, tropical forests, you know, and, and why they're important for the climate and why we're worried. This map, this map shows, this map is carbon or a biomass, above ground biomass. The darker green it is, the more biomass there is. And what you see right away is that the, the tropics, the tropical forests, contain most of the, you know, more than half of the, the, the biomass, the above ground biomass on a planet. So that's the, the biomass in trunks and limbs and leaves of trees. And this is where I and my team work is in the Amazon and in Congo in particular. Um, these, and so these forests contain a huge amount of biomass. And when we think about that, it, it, they're, they're actually, really important part of the climate system because it, it, they're actually, in, these forests are actually an enormous collection of factories. Each tree is a factory. And each tree, what it does is it soaks up sunlight and takes energy and it pulls in CO2 and it expels water vapor. Um, basically they're pulling in the CO2, they're using the energy to create wood and to create sugars and they're expelling water in the process. And they do that 360, 365 days a year. So forests in the, in the higher latitudes have a much shorter growing season and therefore do this only a short period of time of the year, but tropical forests do it year round. And that has really important implications for the climate when you think about it. You know, so what are they doing? First of all, they soak up a lot of carbon. When we look at this, when we look at tropical forests in total, they're responsible for something like 20% of all 
gross CO2 uptake each year on the planet. So they're, they're taking up essentially 20% of what humans are putting in the atmosphere every year. So they're providing this enormous climate service of taking carbon out of the atmosphere. But they do a lot more for climate. They, they produce water vapor, so they, they make it rain. They make an enormous amount of rain. They produce water vapor on a huge scale. One tree, can, one tree in the tropics will expel something like 500, liter, 500 liters of water a day. All that water moves around and just creates rain all over the planet. Um, they also cool the planet. Uh, trees are essentially a giant air conditioner. By, by, by soaking up the energy and, and expelling water, they're, they're cooling the surface. And we see in the Amazon and in, in Congo, if, if you cut down the forest, you essentially in, instantly change the temperature by 10 degrees Fahrenheit or five degrees C roughly um, for that location. It's a permanent change in temperature as long as you don't have that, those trees there. And that adds up. When we look at the, the global temperature, the tropics, the, those forests cool the planet by about one degree C or two degrees Fahrenheit. And said another way, you know, if we lose those forests, we're warming the planet by one degree C um, because we lose these services of, car we put carbon in the atmosphere and we lose the air conditioning. So, you know, what is happening when we deforest as is occurring in the Amazon, and as things get warmer, as I said, first of all, it gets extremely hot when we deforest. 10 degrees C or 10 degrees Fahrenheit right away. Rainfall decreases. What we see is the dry season gets longer. These two changes have huge implications for the remaining forest because what they do is the extra heat and the, the lack of rainfall leads to more frequent fires and just mortality in general of the, of the remaining trees. And that leads to grass invasion, which leads to more fires. And it's a, it's a, a cycle by which the edges of the forest degrade and the edges move back into the healthier forest, continually degrading the forest as it goes. The problem, when we think of this in the larger scale, you know, the, the cycle feeds in itself. When we think of this in the larger scale, the real problem begins to occur. Is we have an enormous amount of deforestation and we have a climate that's changing, that's getting warmer just from the external, you know, it's the CO2 problems. When we think about that, that's, and we have this continuous degradation. And there's something like in the Amazon, in the Southeast Amazon, there are tens and tens of thousands of square of, of kilometers of edges. And those, you know, each of those edges is long run. So what we've seen there is a very large area in the Southeast Amazon is now, is now, is now degrading in place and becoming less and less like a tropical forest. It has less biomass in total. It's putting more carbon in the atmosphere. It's in fact, releasing more carbon to the atmosphere than it's soaking up. So some of these forests have already tipped over to sources of carbon rather than sinks. And this is just a picture of what a, a heavily degraded, degraded forest looks like. This was never logged or cut down. This is just cyclic fires and heating have resulted in a, in a rainforest turning into essentially a savanna. Uh, and that's what we worry about on the much larger scale. Thank you. Okay. So Thank you all for that whirlwind tour of some of the most important systems within our global climate system and some of the, the risks that we face um, as these systems change in response to, to rapid warming. Of course, the, the title of this event was Tipping Points and we posed the question in the title, right? Are there points of no return? And I guess, the, the main question really that, that I wanna get, uh, you know, get a response from each of you on is, is this framing of tipping points a useful one? These are all systems where that language is, is frequently used. Is it really a, a useful framing for thinking about what is happening in these systems or, or is there perhaps a better way to think about um, the, the ongoing processes and changes happening in each of these? systems. And Mike, you are next to me on my screen. So maybe I will throw that to you first. Thanks. Um, you know, that's, that's one of those that, that, that tipping points have been discussed in the Amazon, in the Amazon in particular, for a very long time. The idea that if we deforest too much of the Amazon, the climate will change enough that it'll no longer grow back. Um, we'll, we'll lose the rest of it. And it we'll lose the rest of it. Yeah, I'm sorry. If we deforest enough, rainfall changes, we lose everything. Um, I'm less worried about that kind of a scale. I think that, you know, I think that's less, 
of a worry if the climate were not changing. <laughs> but uh, but I do. But we certainly see in you know, for example, the Southeast Amazon, where we've we've changed the environment enough that the, the forest is now by itself shifting into something else. It's shifting into something that's more reminiscent of uh, a transitional forest or even a savanna. Um, and that is something that on our time scale, if we do not control things like deforestation and fire is not reversible. So maybe not a global tipping point, but regional tipping points happening throughout the larger area of, of the yeah. Amazon. That's how I tend to think of it, or, or in other tropical regions. It, it's more of a regional because of the external pressures that are being put on it. And Sue, that's something you already hinted at in your presentation as well, this idea that when we're thinking about how permafrost is changing, um, that both time scale and spatial scale are really important factors. So global tipping point, yes or no? And, and how do space and time play into your thinking on that? So I, um, yeah, I, I'd say I, I, don't, I don't find tipping point the most useful way in thinking about it. Um, I'll start with that for a couple of reasons. One is just because it's not exactly, it's not exactly how the world, how the, how the world works or the ecosystems function, right? I mean, the Arctic is a huge place. And so there's not a tipping point. And also I'd say as, as like how humanity works, right? I mean, so there's things that are happening in the Arctic where you're releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, um, but that's not happening just in its own world, right? It's this connected world. So what happens with that depends on what happens in the tropics and in our response to it. So globally, if we got to a point where like there was no way we could stop permafrost thaw and that was leading to increased warming, uh, we have a lot of other problems. I don't even know if we'll be, I mean, honestly, like we're at one degree warming right now and there's huge problems on the planet. And so I feel like, you know, when I showed you, okay, at, you know, at our current trajectory, we can expect, you know, maybe up to 150 billion tons of permafrost carbon emissions to be released. Um, we don't want to get there and, and we don't want to get worse. And so, and then in terms of this time scale, yeah, like, is it, a, you know, is it irreversible? If, if, if carbon goes into the atmosphere, it can be taken up by a plant and then fixed again and wind up in soil and perhaps soil in the Arctic. And if we cool, then it could become permafrost. It's just that the, 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 that, you know, that arrow of like sort of, the, you know, to reverse the arrow is quite a bit slower, right? Like it took a really long time to get that carbon into the permafrost. And once it's in the atmosphere, it, it's not really reversible on human relevant timeframes. And then as I showed, you saw in that picture, some of the processes on the ground, um, that is a regional tipping point. That place is never going to be a forest. Once the ground collapses in these extreme events, like it's, I mean, not, I, I don't want to say never, but in the time frame where humans will be here on this earth, it, that that regional impact is irreversible. And Sarah, how about with, with ice shelves? You used a, a phrase in your presentation, commitment points, maybe a little bit different than tipping points. Uh, is, is it a similar, you know, hearing kind of a similar refrain from, from Mike and Sue here that single global tipping point is maybe not the way we should be thinking about this? Yeah, I think that's true across the different systems that we're all studying, even though they're all quite distinct. Um, in terms of the ice sheets, there are certainly uh, tipping points or um, instabilities that are inherent in the physics of both the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. And, and as you know, sort of a scientist or a model or looking out over long terms, these are useful things to understand and we're spending a lot of effort trying to understand them. So I'll start by saying there is a use for them. I, I want to echo um, Sue's point, you know, what is the, the space and time scale that, that we're interested in sort of on the human relevance side? So in the case of something like West Antarctica, we have this marine ice sheet instability. You know, the best models, and, and you know, this is a moving target, but we're narrowing towards the target, suggests that there's a big difference between you know, a um, 1.5 degrees rise versus um, a two degrees rise in terms of which side of that threshold of instability we end up on and whether the West Antarctic ice sheet enters a period of sort of unstoppable retreat, you know, which would add 
um, you know, sort of three or more meters of sea level, which is a lot. Uh, so that is important. On the other hand, in Greenland, um, we don't have this kind of uh, collapse or unstoppable retreat, but we have something um, called the melt elevation feedback. And again, there we do think that there is something in the physics there where uh, as you warm and melt Greenland, you're going you know, Greenland is high and cold in the center because the ice is thick. It's not because it's sitting on top of a mountain top. And so the more that you melt Greenland, the smaller Greenland becomes. And so now you have parts of the ice sheet that used to be cold enough to have snowfall that are now receiving rain. You may have heard in the news this summer, um, there was quite a bit of news about the fact that there was rain recorded for the very first time in history at the summit of Greenland. So over two miles high on top of Greenland, it was raining, right? This is shouldn't be happening, hasn't happened before. If it starts to rain on Greenland instead of snowing, you're gonna rapidly lose that ice. And if you get the ice to a low enough elevation, where it's gonna be receiving rain rather than snow, it's really, that's gonna trigger this, this threshold as well. Um, so I think those are important points. On the other hand, <laughs> the total loss of a part of Western Arctic of Greenland, this is this kind of looking out the thousand plus year view, you know, are we on the pathway to that? I think is somewhat less useful because um, we don't need to be past the point of no return to lose all of Greenland to be very concerned. I think that's a really great point. And I see Sue nodding and there have already been uh, a handful of questions, which by the way, feel free to add questions, preferably if you could put them in the Q&A rather than the chat. So the two little thought bubbles as opposed to the single uh, thought bubble icon down on the bottom of your screen, that would be great. Um, and I'll be looking through there. We probably won't address uh, a lot of individual questions, but looking for themes that that would be helpful to highlight there. So, so please do add your questions there. And, and one theme that's already come out is like, well, okay, but does that mean we shouldn't be worried? And people actually voicing a concern that if we say there isn't a tipping point, that might give license uh, people license to not be so worried. That's not what I'm hearing from you guys. And in fact, we got together last week to kind of talk through some of this and, and actually came up with an alternative um, analogy, I guess, for what's happening in these systems, as opposed to a tipping point being like going over a single cliff. Um, you guys said, maybe it's more like we're falling down a set of stairs. And like in a video game, the stairs above you are kind of disappearing as you go. So it's not just a single fall, but you're also talking about being on a pathway to the bottom of the stairwell, and that's where we don't want to end up. But you've also really been highlighting that this is not yet fully committed and the importance of the choices we make now. So maybe we could just go back and reiterate, like, what is the path in each of these cases that we are on right now? And how much can we deviate from that path with the choices that we make about human behavior right now? I can jump in a bit. I, I really liked it, you know, when we were discussing earlier this sort of staircase idea, because I, I do think there's a concern with the tipping point being this cliff that it's really an either or, like either you get to the edge of the cliff and you somehow stop, um, or if you've gotten too far, you know, this idea that if we don't meet some target by next year or by 2030 that we, well, we might as well just fly off the cliff. I mean, that to me is absolutely the wrong approach. Um, you know, we are racing down the stairs and there is irreversible loss at every stair that we race down, but what stair we end up, the bottom stair we end up, whether it has to do with how much sea level we're committed to, how much permafrost loss, how much Amazon loss is entirely within our control. And just as this example with, uh, you know, sort of ice loss illustrates, um, if you reflect back on the image of Kilimanjaro, I mean, pretty much that's gone, right? We've lost that ice, we've lost many mountain glaciers. But for the large polar ice sheets, everything is really within our control. And the best models do suggest that, you know, which side of the, you know, the emissions pathways and this temperature, whether it's one and a half degrees or two degrees, is a critical difference in terms of starting the to run fast faster and faster down the stairs to the point where we end up on a lower stair, more committed sea level, or whether we can slow that, that down. Yeah, I, I really agree with that. We, you, you know, when you look at the Amazon, we, we've, we've hit a one degree C, you know, the, the planet's one degree C warmer, a bit more than that. And we've already lost a significant, you know, we've already really altered a significant fraction of the forest. 
you know. Now, to be clear, Mike, care. in your case, that's a combination, right, of climate change and direct human action of deforestation, right? It is. That's a little it bit is. different so than, than something it, like that. And it is different. And that's where, you know, it's, it's more, comp it can be more complicated there because we have these two things, two, you know, we have to get humans in there, cutting things down and lighting fires. And we've got a changing climate that makes those fires worse and worse. Um, so with one degree, we've already put a dent. With two, I would be, you, you know, you can look at, I look at that and say, am I going to lose 40% of the Amazon? I might. And do I want that? Absolutely not. Um, so, you know, we can stop deforestation and we can stop lighting fires and that's going to go a long way to help the Amazon. But we're still going to lose some if we continue to warm the temperature. And of course, as you mentioned, stopping deforestation will also help us with slowing the global climate change. So, so there's Two, two, two steps or two kind of decisions and, and actions we can take to, to slow that descent down the stairs there, which is stopping deforestation as well as stopping greenhouse gas emissions. So Sue, I wanna make sure we let you jump in here as well. <laughs> yeah, just real quickly, I'd say, um, I think as you get farther down that staircase, it gets harder and harder to slow your speed of, you know, your speed down. So it's not linear. Um, and so when we think about, you know, yes, we haven't gone off this cliff, but, it, there is more urgency than the cliff because the longer you wait, the harder it gets, right? The more we've committed, the more we're having, you know, increased fires, which are, you know, adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, which in the north are also thawing the permafrost. And so, and it does seem as the more we learn, there are more kind of surprises. There are more nonlinear events than I think um, in not all of the cases, but in many cases than we knew about. And scientific, you know, we're going into a new world that science really hasn't been in before. So humans haven't observed before. And so unfortunately it doesn't seem like things are going in the slowing down direction. It does tend to seem that things are going the speeding up direction. So to me, it's there's more urgency because I, I don't want any more surprises, right? I mean, like we, we've had enough and they're not good surprises, so. So Sue, I want to follow on that and, and a couple of questions that have showed up in the Q&A and the, the chat. And um, that has to do with the, the difficulty actually of gauging where we are on that staircase and how quickly we're moving. I mean, this is a huge challenge for permafrost in part just because it's such a, a huge area. But Give us a fuller sense of why is it so hard to figure out exactly where we are on those stairs, how quickly we're going down or, or how quickly we will end up going down. Yeah, so I mean, the, it's, the Arctic is a huge area and it's hard to access a lot of it. Um, you know, and there's multiple countries that comprise the Arctic and there's multiple different types of ecosystems and the monitoring of carbon um, emissions or carbon fluxes, so uptake and loss or the exchange between the the biosphere and the atmosphere are quite low in the Arctic and our you know, spatial distribution of monitoring is quite low, our temporal distribution. So you know, we go up, scientists tend to go up to the Arctic in the summertime when it's warmer and light out and then we leave in the winter, but the world, ha you know, micro microbes are so active in the winter. And so there's a huge gap in our monitoring and even knowing the carbon balance of the Arctic right now a lot, a lot of uncertainty. Um, getting that information to, into models and getting models to global models to function and to incorporate permafrost in them, you know, they, they weren't developed for northern regions, you know, they weren't calibrated for the north. And so even when permafrost is represented, the processes are represented in, in the way that we know that they're happening in reality. And then it's like getting that information out to people. You know, we do know something. And then there's this other sort of challenge of getting that information out into the world. When we think about, you know, globally, we're, you know, counting for the different nations, how much carbon we're emitting and what our commitments are to stay below two degrees Celsius. We do have some sense of the range of how much carbon uh, can be released from the Northern region, but that's not accounted for in this sort of global bookkeeping. So our efforts to stay towards 1.5 or 2C um, just aren't even accounting for permafrost. So these are some of the challenges of just sort of reduce, you know, increasing what we know by monitoring more and getting that into the model so we could project into the future and then also getting that information into the people who need to make decisions based on it. Sarah, I would I would assume that when it comes to things like the ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica, there are plenty of logistical as well as uh, scientific hurdles to to really pinpointing where we are and and where we're headed. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, following on Sue's point, of course, you know, these regions are very difficult to access and tricky to work in. Um, fortunately, over the last couple of decades, um, the ability to observe the changes in ice, polar ice using satellites has really exploded. And so we have a very brief window of observation for this observational era where we can use um, high precision satellite observations to do things like, you know, gravimetry to actually weigh from space the um, amount of ice over Greenland or Antarctica. And um, we can also do things like use altimetry to see how the surface height has changed over time. And we can measure uh, uh, spatially, you know, the growth and shrinking of the edges of the ice. So you can combine all those methods and you can get over a couple of decades kind of a pretty good sense for where we're at. But of course, that's, you know, not even the blink of an eye in terms of the time scale of change to get uh, further perspective, you know, where we stand today, we need to use sort of more geologic or paleo, paleo climate tools. Um, and one of the uh, ways that my group has really um, contributed to this is using ice cores. So we can actually then extend this very brief observational area and go back hundreds of thousands of years and say, well, how, you know, for example, has Greenland been growing or shrinking or melting over time? And one of the alarming things that we showed um, in a paper a couple of years ago is that the, you know, this again gets to Sue's point that the staircase is not even. So this melting that we're seeing, this runoff from Greenland that we're seeing is um, in response to warming is very nonlinear. And so we are able to show over now a multi-century period that Greenland is melting and losing mass um, sort of exponentially in response to this warming rather than in a, in a very steady way. But it's true um, that we need to we need to place you know sort of today's observations in the right context. I would argue that we really also need to expand our knowledge of the past so that we know how ice has behaved on longer time scales because these ice sheets are not uh, sp uh, especially the large polar ice sheets. They're not responding sort of day to day to, or even year to year. There's a lot of noise in the weather that we experience each season. So in order to really understand the response to climate, you have to average over many years and because our satellite observation era is really so short. We need these longer scale um, geologic observations to help us understand the behavior into the future. Mike, I wanna uh, turn to you. I, I once uh, had a, a fisheries scientist say to me, uh, counting fish is just like counting trees, only they move and they're hidden under the water. The implication <laughs> being that counting trees is easy because they stand there and you can just see them. And yet you're saying, there's very active discussion about whether or not there is a tipping point, we're at the tipping point, what the future of the Amazon is. So what are some of the challenges there in figuring out um, exactly what's going on? Yeah, yeah, you know, and like anything, it, it, you know, tropical rainforest, it's a challenging environment, first of all, it, you know, until recently, it was, a, it was a, a lot of these places were tough places to go to, to study. Um, and, and you look at, it comes down to things like, you know, there are all kinds of, we have all kinds of models that try to model how forests will respond to changes in climate. The problem with that is the models just don't have the processes in there that, that because in part, we don't understand, you know, what actually kills the, the, the tree? That, that sounds odd, but you know, what, what is the event that results in mortality for a tree? That's, that's really not even well known. And of course, it, it will change depending on the conditions. You know, there are several different things that could kill it, but the actual mortality, it's not well known. So you don't really, so then if you can't, if you can't model how a tree dies and what regrowth would be realistically, then you really don't know where that edge is going to be. Um, it's things like that. And, and extreme, you know, and, and a lot of this occurs because of extreme events. And extreme events, this gets back to the points that have already made, these things are changing in ways we didn't know they would change. You know, we just had a, we just had a, what amounted to a severe drought in the Amazon this year because it was much, much hotter than normal. The rainfall, the rainfall was actually normal in much of the Amazon, but the temperature was much greater, up to two or four degrees C greater. That puts, that is it's stress just like a drought. And so trees will die because of that. And again, we didn't, that wasn't something that's really well accounted for. I will, the last thing I'll say about that though is, I, I always like to, you know, so there's a lot of uncertainty, but I, but I really like to say, you, you know, don't let the uncertainty get in the way of action. Um, because I know what the outcome is. If I do nothing, I'm gonna end up with 
a terrible situation. If I do something, it will be better. That's it, it's really all I have to know at one level. And that's exactly where I was uh, about to go with my next question, right? Is, is, okay, there are uncertainties. We're not entirely, uh, you know, we don't have a crystal clear vision of what that staircase below us looks like and how quickly we're going down it. But we know enough to know that we are accelerating down that stairwell and we don't want to go any further. Um, and Sue, you alluded to the fact that it would be possible if we cooled the planet to kind of run that cycle in reverse. Um, I wonder if each of you could just offer in your mind kind of what, what is needed to, to stop that accelerating descent down the staircase and, and what are the, some of the, the, the best opportunities or mechanisms we have at our disposal to actually accomplish that? Um, I can start off. So um, I think in addition to running it in reverse, we can also halt it. So we've already committed, you know, permafrost is already thawing. We've already committed say to 30% of it thawing, but that's a lot better than 70%, particularly if your house is on that, you know, 35%, you know, that's going to take us over the edge. Um, so there's, we definitely can take actions. I mean, one of the problems with greenhouse gases is because they're global. So what happens in lower latitudes makes its way up to northern regions. But one of the benefits of greenhouse gases is that they're globally mixed. And so what happens in lower latitude countries also impacts northern regions and vice versa. And so we can, we can, you know, stop things by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I think, you know, what does that mean? It means protecting tropical forests can also then protect permafrost thaw. And it means like, yes, our individual actions matter, but I think right now we need to act so fast that we should be taking action and demanding action from leadership um, of our countries, of our, you know, of the businesses that we work with. Like there's right now, there's really no excuse and we just don't have time to wait because the longer we wait, the worse it gets, the more we've already committed ourselves to. And so it's much harder to go back than it is to stop. And so I think, you know, in terms of permafrost though, I think the major, major action that needs to be taken is to protect forests and, and, and very quickly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Mike, that tees you up nicely, but of course, stopping deforestation in the tropics is not as simple as just putting an edict out there to stop deforestation. There are uh, people who live there who uh, need to produce food and, and make a living. So, and this is, you're right in the mix, figuring out how do we stop deforestation while also uh, enabling well-being and sustainable development. So what are, what are some of the, the mechanisms and opportunities there? Yeah, so that so getting to Sue's point, it's, it's absolutely right. When you look at tropical forests, it, we have to, it, first of all, photosynthesis is the only thing taking CO2 out of the atmosphere right now, right? So we have to protect that. So to protect the forest, we have to end fires. And that getting to Heather's point then is it, we have to find ways for agriculture to continue, whether that's a small household agriculture or some of the larger agriculture, much larger scale stuff that's occurring without any new deforestation, and with and and with reducing the degradation that's occurring, that means again eliminate fires from any part of the process. It, it means things like helping households uh, get you know getting technical support to households so that they can better grow crops on their land. You know these many of these households are just growing from themselves and a tiny bit for the market. So you know and it, and it's. It turns out that a little bit of technical support to families goes a long way in improving well-being through improving crop production um, and their access to markets. So we have to, it's really what has to be done is we have to be working with the individuals. There has to be outreach to do that. Um, and then there's also just, you know, some of the larger, there's a lot of illegal deforestation that takes place that has to be gotten under control. And that's more of a federal and state level that can be challenging in some, but it can be very challenging if, if, if there's not the political will to do it. So Sarah, last but certainly not least, um, yeah, how, how do you think about what it is we need to do and what the opportunities um, or mechanisms we have available to, to get it done? Sure, I mean, it's a daunting problem. And I think that causes a lot of people to uh, 
fear that there's nothing they can do um, or that the problem is too big or that we've already lost the point of the return. I think if you take anything away from today, hopefully it's that um, you know everything we do now, whether it's reducing emissions, um, uh, reducing deforestation um, or adaptation, you know everything is gonna help because the faster we go down these stairs, the harder the problem is, but we're taking it step by step. So we can slow down and we can prevent ourselves from going over one more step. Um, you know, when it comes to things like sea level rise and the loss of ice, while there's a certain amount baked in, none of the kind of collapse or tipping points that we're talking about um, really should worry people in terms of the next decades, but they should still be worried because the sea level rise that we're experiencing now, you know, has nothing to do with passing these instability points. It's entirely this nonlinear response to warming of the atmosphere and the ocean. So the more quickly that we can reduce emissions and slow warming and get back on these lower target scenarios, the better we're going to be. But at the same time, we have to really help communities that are already experiencing. This is something that's happening right now. Communities are being flooded in the US, around the world. There's displaced people. There's climate emergencies already happening. So we can't also just worry about the emissions. We also need to help communities, especially um, uh, communities that have been affected or under-resourced communities to prepare, perhaps to retreat. We have to be prepared to move inland. We have to um, help make that more equitable. So I think we need to be doing both those things in parallel. Well, it is 3.59. We have uh, raced through this hour. I want to thank all three of you for a fabulous conversation. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined us and for all of your dozens and dozens of fabulous questions and comments. And one theme that we haven't uh, addressed a whole lot yet, but I want to just quickly um, in our last moment here is what do I do with this information? How do I share this? How do I talk about this? Um, and will these presentations be available? So quickly to answer some of those questions, uh, this whole uh, conversation uh, has been recorded. That recording will be available. Uh, we will email it to all of you next week. It will be on our website, woodwellclimate.org and also on our YouTube channel. So one easy thing you can do is simply share that video with those that you would like to communicate about uh, this with. Um, hopefully we've also offered you uh, an alternative framing besides this single tipping point um, and point of no return with the acceleration down the stairwell today and some thoughts about the work that is going on to try to stop our acceleration down that staircase. So again, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, we hope you will all join us back here same time Wednesday, two weeks from now for our next in this series, which takes that next step and starts to uh, delve into what Mike was getting at in terms of uh, photosynthesis being the, the best tool we have right now for pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, looking at the global potential of natural systems and also the technologies that are in development for pulling carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere as uh, some of the solutions and opportunities that we have available to us. So please join us there. And um, I will, uh, as we close down here, put a link up for you to find our website and uh, subscribe to our newsletter to learn more about those events and learn more information that you can continue sharing with your communities. So thank you again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.